I'm very honored today, uh, as a Villanova professor and director of the Center for Marketing and Public Policy Research, to have you here, and specifically to have our good friend, uh, the Minister of Foreign Trade, Katja Polidori, who also, I'd like to say, is a visiting professor to Villanova from time to time, address you. Uh, as we well know, it's an interesting time within the world, and to have such a distinguished leader come in and directly speak to you, to teach to you this morning, is a true honor. And Katya, we thank you for attending this morning with your busy schedule. Uh, I'd like to give a formal introduction to our interim dean, Kevin Clark, who's been instrumental in helping us achieve both your undergraduate rankings, uh, number seven, Business Week, I always like to get that out there, but also to help lead some of our global bridges uh, to both Italy, which is a proud partner, but also throughout the world. So without further ado, Kevin Clark. Thanks, John. <clears throat> And so uh, this morning, we're quite honored to have Katia Palladori and the contingent from the Republic of Italy here with us. Uh, I've had the great pleasure to have been uh, to the Republic uh, on several occasions, as have some of our faculty. Bob LeClaire is here as well. Uh, some of you may have uh, experienced some of our study abroad immersion trips to Italy, and those who haven't, I highly recommend them. Uh, but I'd like to give just a very brief uh, overview of, of the relationship that the Villanova School of Business has built with the Republic, uh, the experiences that we provide or access to the experiences that we provide to you as students. Uh, and then uh, I will pass it to Mr. Joe Del Rosso, who is a double graduate, both of the business school and the law school, to talk a little bit more in depth about some of the other relationships between the region, uh, between Italian Americans and the Republic, because these are very important uh, relationships for us to leverage, to build upon, especially in these times. And so, as many of you know, uh, part of being a premier business school in the United States is offering a variety of experiences to our students. Uh, it's providing a vision for what a business school education should be uh, beyond the technical know-how, the, the prerequisites, if you will, uh, that allow you to be successful in your localized careers. And so at the Villanova School of Business, amongst many other pillars, uh, we have made uh, significant investments in the development in you of a global mindset. And so globalization, study abroad experiences, the content that you uh, face in your courses uh, becomes more and more globally oriented. And we feel that that is a critical uh, mindset that you need to develop. And bringing folks like Katya uh, and, and other uh, leaders uh, to the Villanova School of Business is one way, just one, that we can help you uh, broaden your perspectives and understand how you fit and how your organizations fit uh, in, the, in the broader world economy and world socioeconomic systems. And so it is uh, really my, my pleasure to host events like this uh, and, to, uh, and to try to build even stronger relationships with uh, the folks in Europe and around the world. Um, this weekend, I was at uh, an event for NIAF, the National, American, uh, National Italian American Foundation in Washington, D.C. And I can tell you that involvement in these sorts of cultural uh, organizations is also a critical way that you as young people can form this global mindset and become uh, what we would like you to become, and that is global citizens in the truest and broadest sense of the word. Uh, here at the Villanova School of Business, we also have other mechanisms. The Center for Marketing Public Policy Research is certainly one of those mechanisms for understanding how business people and a business school curriculum intersects with the public sector, with government officials, with economic policy uh, that sometimes is talked about inside of corporations, but in the very real sense is the intersection between corporations, nonprofits, and the governmental sector. And so again, broadening your perspective so that you can be effective agents of change and global citizens is really what the Villanova School of Business is about. And one of the ways that we present, we believe, uh, an exceptional uh, and differentiated educational experience for you. And so uh, this is not about me. I'm running the ship for the year, maybe a little longer, we'll see. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Joe Del Rosso to talk a little bit more about NIAF and some of the other experiences from his perspective as a double alum, and then we will uh, get on with the, with, the, uh, with the presentation. Thanks, Professor. Good morning, or uh, should I say buongiorno. <laughs> but, uh, it is a great honor for me to be here today as a graduate of the, uh, in, in my time, it was the School of Commerce and Finance with my degree in accounting, and then ultimately uh, my law degree but I realize the importance of um, the 
exposure to the international markets when I really started my law career in Washington, D.C. Um, and I'm going to really age myself now. When I went to the SEC, our means of communication overseas, and this wasn't that long ago, <laughs> we had a teletype machine in the basement. There, was, there were no fax machines. There were no computers. But, you know, um, you can imagine, though, now, as the world has flattened, um, the importance of being really connected in and having the ability to maneuver in the inter international markets. Um, I have the honor of chairing the Board of Trustees of the American University of Rome, and I would encourage all of you, a um, little prejudice towards Italy, but really, you know, embrace the idea of, of study abroad, whether it is in Italy or, you know, another country either in the East or another European country. One of the advantages uh, of the program we have here at Villanova is uh, some really, I think, fine programs uh, to gain some experience in Italy. In particular, our program at the American University of Rome um, and Villanova <coughs> involves uh, not only classroom um, experience, but also internships while you're there. And um, I think that um, this is critical to the, to the mission of the National Italian American Foundation. We provide scholarship support for those programs, and we really uh, want to continue to build the bridge between the United States and Italy in the areas of culture, education, international finance. And finally, I would uh, again, I think, offer our heartfelt thanks for Minister Polidori's visit today. Uh, Villanova is the only university that the uh, <laughs> official delegation from Italy is visiting on, on this uh, trip. As, as uh, Dean Clark has mentioned, that uh, the dinner Saturday night in Washington, 3,000 people with a keynote address from President Obama, several members of our uh, administration in Washington, and um, very uh, senior leaders from Italy were in attendance. And I think um, with what's going on right now in the international markets, especially the European debt crisis, and Minister Polidori's position, it's a great honor for her to be here today to give a significant policy speech here at Villanova. And uh, I think there is no better way to show the value of a Villanova education. And it's, it's no uh, accident that we have the rating we have as number seven business school in the country uh, because when a university like this uh, is attracts somebody of uh, someone of, of uh, Minister Polidori's uh, position. I think it speaks well of this university, but also uh, is a uh, absolute benefit and a value add to all of you. You know our uh, our valued students. So um, without any further ado, I would like you to give a warm welcome to uh, Minister Polidori. Thank you. We're going to present um, the, um, uh, an award to her this morning. So, Kevin, why don't you okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, do the presentation now? So, so I actually have to be at a dean's council meeting because I have to run the school as well. I'm a little stretched thin this year. And so uh, what, we, what we really wanted to do today was recognize uh, a preeminent leader uh, within a foreign uh, context, within a foreign government, and you all are, as business school students, are very aware of the turmoil we have both in the United States but also around the globe. And someone with uh, the, the, the mind and the approach and the energy that, that Minister Polidori has, these are the sorts of folks who are critical in figuring out how we as, an, as a world are going to get through the difficult economic times that we have. And so we are very, very honored to have her here and her delegation. Uh, it's really quite a coup for us. And so we, are, uh, we, we thought it would be appropriate to bring forth the inaugural Foreign Leaders Award for Minister Polidori. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Really. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to receive this award from Villanova University. Uh, Dean Kevin Clark. President of NIAF Giudarraso, uh, Honorable Berardi, uh, Consul General of Italy Scotto, uh, Professor and Lecturers, dear students, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I already had the pleasure and the honor to be here. However, I'm so touched and uh, thrilled today that I really feel as, as uh, if I come to Villanova University for the first time. Uh, it is my not intention to hold an academic <coughs> lecture on international trade. 
uh, which is a complex and challenging subject. I would rather focus on a number of specific points which I consider to be particularly relevant in the context of strengthening relations between Italy and United States of America and between the latter and the European Union. I will try to pass on to you in the about 30 minutes of my speech some key message to which I attach great importance. With your indulgence, I will also mention a few data and figures and quote some literature, mostly non-Italian, in order to offer you as much as possible objective evaluation on my country. As Italian Vice Minister in charge of international trade, I will of course focus on <laughs> commerce. Last week was very intense in this regard. A large meeting of Italian European decision makers took place in Rome just three, just three days ago, just in time for me to fly to Washington, despite the snow, to be then here today. We decided to call this meeting State General on Foreign Trade to mark our intention to make it a real turning point. It is uh, needless to say that the current economic scenario is difficult, and uh, you know very well. For the first time, we are facing a global financial crisis that arises not from emerging countries, as was the case of the previous Asian, Latin American and Russian crisis, but from the very heart of industrialized Western countries. The United States was in some respect the prime mover of this, with the some prime crisis that eventually expanded from the private sector to the public one and originated what is now a sovereign debt crisis. This crisis, although in different ways, involves today United States, United States and Italy as well as European countries such as Greece, Portugal, Spain, Ireland and, as some observers say, perhaps France. Considering this difficult scenario, the good trend of international trade is even more striking. At the global level, the 2008 and the 2009 financial crisis resulted in a sharp contraction of trade. The WTO had even warned against a return to protectionism similar to what happened in 1929, when the economic crisis was made even worse by unilateral trade barriers. Luckily enough, this did not happen. Some protectionist measures were indeed taken, but they were modest in scope. By now, international trade has already regained much of what was lost. This is true also for Italy. We consider international trade a key component of our economy. Our combined import and export, around 700 billion euro, are equal to one quarter of our GDP. After the 2008-2009 sharp contraction of trade, our companies are now recovering quickly. Last September, Italian exports to non-EU countries increased by nearly 19%, reaching over 14 billion euros. Even considering the longer period from January to September 2011, Italian export to non-EU countries increased by nearly 17%, uh, totaling a little less than uh, 122 billion euros. This is well above our previous record of 2008. There is more to tell. According to WTO data concerning the second quarter of 2010, Italian exports increased more than any other G7 economy, including Germany and even more than two major global exporters <coughs> such as China and South Korea. The difficult economy uh, international scenario on the one hand, the very positive performance of foreign trade on the other hand, provide a unique study in contrast. That is why I felt the need to launch a new method to try and respond adequately to these challenges and at the same time to repeat these opportunities, the State General that I just mentioned. 
I decided to work together with some major Italian entrepreneurs, with central and local administration, with national agency supporting enterprises and with sectoral experts. We all aimed at, at identifying tools and priorities to support Italian exports, taking into account the new global context. Many of the best Italian entrepreneurs, especially those who are active in the highly competitive international arena, have become increasingly aware of their social <coughs> role. Therefore, they have accepted my invitation to lead the long preparatory stage of our State General. After careful consideration of what is at stake and after wide consultation with all other actors, concerned, they tabled several proposals on how to make the public support to international trade more efficient, more cost-effective, more result-oriented. In other words, thanks to the active involvement of our entrepreneurs, private genius turned into public virtue. In a way, a conceptual revolution, or if you want a paradigm shift, took place during our state general and their preparatory phases. The Italian government passed from the classical top-down to an innovative bottom-up approach in its relation with enterprises and entrepreneurs. The Italian government has decided to listen to enterprises, to hear their needs, to consider their concerns, to take up their suggestions. In other words, the Italian government wants to pay attention to what enterprises really want. In short, more policies, less bureaucracy, less quantity, more quality in the public support to Italian foreign trade and to our enterprises abroad. We decided to act because we cannot wait. Things are moving dramatically quickly. We cannot be left behind. The role of traditional leading countries, namely the Atlantic economies, seems to have been weakened. The multilateral system established at Bretton Woods is eroded. Bilateral agreements, not global frameworks, are now growing in importance. Some say that there is a risk to return to <coughs> ad hoc trade alliances, to protectionist measures even to serious international market distortion. We cannot accept all this. Let me therefore elaborate a little on the Italian foreign trade in the context of the European policies. Italy is a founding member of the European Union and a very active member. <coughs> it is also the third largest net contributor to the EU budget after Germany and France and before Britain. The European Union is placing growing emphasis on concluding bilateral and regional agreements with strategic partners, which means, of course, primarily with the United States, and with expanding economies. Removal of trade barriers, improved access to markets, better conditions for investment, protection of intellectual property, access to raw materials and the opening up of public procurement markets are some top priorities for the European Union. Why do we bet on trade? Because international trade is a powerful, powerful instrument of growth. It is estimated that a 5% increase in our foreign trade brings about a 1% growth in our GDP. In our GDP. It is not surprising, therefore, that we are, in fact, facing a major evolution of the European Union as regards international trades and investments. Let me come now to trade relations of European Union with the United States, which are of paramount importance, accounting the 30% of world trade. Let me be clear on this. I hate the shibboleth that our transatlantic relations are somewhat outdated, having been replaced by other relationships of uh, the United States with other Asian partners and of the European Union with Middle Eastern or Asian or African partners. The facts remain that the greatest share of international trade takes place between the United States and the European Union. This is not surprising 
if we take into account that the European Union as a whole is the largest world economy and the United States is the second largest and that their combined populations are comparable in size to those of China and uh, India. With mutual investment stocks of nearly 2 trillion euros and trading goods and service worth 700 billion euros annually, the EU and USA enjoy the strongest economy relationship between any two economies in the world. In the 2007, the European Union and the United States jointly agreed to establish the Transatlantic Economic Council that now serve as an important political body to oversee and accelerate government to government cooperation with the aim of advancing economic integration between the EU and the USA. I invite you to read the uh, East Foundry Act, the so-called framework for advancing transatlantic economic integration between the United States of America and the European Union, which was signed by then US President Bush, the European Commission President Barroso, and by the President in Office of the European Union Council, Angela Merkel. This framework embodies the common will of such prominent world leaders to work on the promotion of transatlantic economy integration in the areas of intellectual property, investment, trade, financial market and innovation. Since then, the Transatlantic Economic Council has met regularly. Its uh, next meeting will be held in November. At the latest Trade Council in Brussels, I argued that the Transatlantic Economic Council should play a strategic role and help promote a common transatlantic vision on the management of major global issues, thus promoting growth, employment, freedom of, tra freedom of trade, all in compliance with responsibilities and tanning major trading powers. One of the latest efforts in accelerating the process is focused on small and medium-sized enterprises. SMEs are in fact the true backbone of the European economy, representing more than 99% of, of all European business. One out of four of them is Italian. They, pro they provide two out of three of the private sector jobs and contribute to more than half of the total value added created by business in the EU. An SME's best practice conference last June in Brussels dealt with a number of specific topics, including reduction of trade barriers, standardization and regulation, reduction of administrative burdens, environmental uh, challenges and green technologies. Moreover, two weeks ago, a follow-up seminar was held in uh, Washington, D.C. that further analyzed the number of commercial issues pertaining to the SMEs. During the Trade Council in September, I personally strongly welcomed the Commission's initiative in this regard, stressing the importance for our companies, especially small and medium-sized, of the U.S. market. Italy and USA shared the same view on the relevance of international trade. Let me just recall that in nearly 2010, the U.S. government announced the new National Export Initiative, NEI, which is meant to lead to long-term sustainable economic growth for the United States and to double exports over the next five years, an increase which could well support two million American jobs. Let me now further elaborate one some aspect of the relationship between my country and United States. For sure, Italy and United States are geographically far apart. Nowadays, however, the concept of distance is very relative due to the advancement of technology. Let me mention in this regard the well-known essay by Thomas Friedman, The World is Flat, like Giuda Razzo mentioned it before, which describes a world in which distances are virtually cancelled because internet and technological innovation have made everything accessible and immediate and uh, have broken cultural and logistical barriers among different countries. In one world, the world has become <coughs> flat. 
Therefore, despite the Atlantic Ocean uh, that separates us, Italy and the United States are today even close neighbors. Their relation is rooted in history. It is not surprising that this special relation also translated into a blooming bilateral trade, which has exceeded 30 billion euros per year since uh, 2001, with the only ex exception of the crisis here, 2009. What might come as a surprise to some of you is the composition of the bilateral trade between Italy and the US. We export in particular advanced products such as machinery and transport equipment, alongside with so-called mature products, especially fashion, textile, shoes, clothing and jewelry. Let me mention in this regard one single sector, aerospace engineering, in which the cooperation between Italy and USA is well developed. Our two satellites, Agile and Fermi, are conducting useful scientific research. A number of Italian enterprises participate in joint scientific programs conducted by NASA and the European Space Agency. In short, today's Italy is a technological advanced country that exports state-of-the-art technology. Dear professor and, uh, and students, after talking about international trade in general and some aspect of uh, Euro-America <coughs> and uh, Italo-American uh, relation, I would like to continue on a more personal uh, note. Every day I ask myself a simple but difficult question. What should I do today to fulfill the best my mission as a member of Italian government? I feel that I'm called to work with passion and mind which are two sides of the same coin. This means first facing reality and fact and the, as they are, and second working on them in a pushing a vision to improve the society in which I, I live. This means, however, that I need, we all need, to consider a third element, ethics. I know that here at Villanova University, an Augustinian Roman Catholic University, you will all agree with me. Ethics, in my view, means first a real respect of values. Values may be human and also, for at least some of us, <coughs> spiritual. By the way, exploring your website yesterday, I found interesting remarks on Augustine's values in the context of university education and of uh, modern life in general. Yes, real values are those which positively influence our choices. Without values, our lives cannot flourish. This happens to all fields, from politics to economy itself. I beg your indulgence for quoting from a book I happened to write myself, titled Entrepreneur Between Ethics and Education. We live today in an uncertain and rapidly changing world. As a consequent, profit cannot longer be considered as the sole objective of enterprises. The role of enterprises is actually involving no longer mere economic actors, they began to act as social actors. In this new role, they have to interact with all other actors of the national and international community. Enterprises have to assist the results of their action. They have to act taking into account the peculiarities and needs of their social environments. They have to push a global enrichment of society, not just a material one. This means that enterprises must pursue a proper <laughs> ethical dimension. An ethical dimension is necessary to individuals and to social bodies alike. Enterprises which are based on ethics can disseminate culture and cut across different fields of action and different paths of life. Enterprises which are based on ethics will not just preserve and pass on culture and knowledge. They will also live up the real challenge, which is making culture and knowledge grow up and flourish. Yes, values should be rooted in real life. There is nothing naive or abstract in this. Values must be made concrete, objective and real present in the day life of our contemporary world. Values should be able to live up to the hard test of facts. Let me quote just a few hard facts. Yes, we uh, inherited a high debt, 
but our assets are much higher than it. Italy is able to pay even very high interest rates. The Bank of Italy reported that in September our debt decreased by 10 billion compared to August. Our budget deficit is much lower than that of France and it will be reduced to zero in 2030. Thanks to our latest budget law, unemployment is at 8% lower than in France. Uh, not to mention that of Spain that amounts to around 20, uh, 21%. <coughs> Tax revenues have increased by 2.4% compared to the first eight months of 2010. Private savings, while declining, remain high. Our private debt is the second lowest after Germany's among the largest European countries, in striking contrast to the eight private debt in Spain and in Britain. I'm coming to the conclusion of my speech. Is, is somebody yawning? No. You are, of course, uh, all familiar with the concept of the American melting pot. Samuel Huntington, for instance, discussed this concept in his book, who we are. Although I personally disagree with many of uh, his assumptions, this book uh, is uh, interesting and provocative. The melting pot made the integration process of the United States so unique. In this regard, Huntington recalls that before the Civil War, many politicians and writers referred to the United States in the plural. For example, the United States are a nation or the USA wants to. After 1865, the use of the verb was modified and the United States, while remaining a noun grammatically plural, is used with the singular verb. The United States is a nation. The United States wants to. In other words, speaking of the United States of America today, we have a, a clash not of civilization but between grammar and politics. And of course, politics has the upper hand. This marks, in my opinion, the final transition from a plural identity to a single and a shared one, as shown in the motto of the United States, states a pluribus unum, for many one. Within the European Union, we are going through a similar process of closer integration. There are areas in which this integration is virtually complete, such as currency, agriculture, and, of course, foreign trade. The European integration continues to progress despite all the difficulties on the basis of the well-known bicycle model. If the bike stops, then it falls. To keep a bicycle in balance, you must always go forward. This is what happened in the last 50 years in the European Union. Also, the European Union's motto reflects somehow the United States' motto hand. In its Latin version, sound like in varietate concordia, which means united in diversity. The motto means that via the EU, Europeans are united in working together for peace and prosperity, and that the many different cultures, traditions and languages in Europe are a positive asset for the continent. A final remark. I would like to refer again to the mottos of the European Union and of the United States to note in passing that they are in Latin. As you all know, Latin is, uh, Latin is the ancient language of Rome, from where it spread to Europe and through Latin languages from Europe to America and Asia. It was the mother tongue of St. Augustine himself. It is the language in which they wrote all his masterpiece, from Confessiones to the Civitate Dei. That is why I wish to greet you in, in Latin with these words. Parva sunt foris arma, nisi est concilium domi, which today could be translated with something like, if you are not at peace at home, you cannot be successful abroad. I think that this happens to our bilateral relation, in trade and in all of other relevant fields. The European Union and United States are close allies and friends, and they must remain close allies and friends. Through their alliance and friendship, they will continue playing their role in the international arena, promoting their legitimate interests and striving to promote those of the world alike. Let me stress again 
how much I perceive this opportunity to deliver my speech in this uh, historical university. And again, my sincere thanks for the warm welcome given to me today. Thank you. A few points that I'd like to touch on from a, from a <coughs> teaching perspective that I think uh, you know, lend themselves to the world that you now face. When I came in as a faculty member nearly 10 years ago, our former dean, Tim Monahan, uh, and thank you for being here today, Tim, asked you to be adaptive problem solvers. The question we have for you now is how do you grow, whether it's growing your business, whether it's growing a country. We thank Minister Polidori for her leadership and the program she's putting in place to answer that question. So how do you be adaptive, and then also how do you grow? To provide concluding comments today, I'd like to introduce the Chairman of Investor Formazione, uh, Vice President of the National Italian American Foundation, and most importantly to you, visiting faculty to the Villanova School of Business, Mr. Paolo Catalfamo. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm very pleased again to have uh, my very dear friend Katia accepting our invitation to be here today. Uh, when she came two years ago uh, with, with John Coso, we ran a very unusual uh, course on uh, post bailout, and uh, uh, I think the course was quite successful because we actually tried to find out what were the positive uh, in a very kind of depressed situation where everybody really didn't know, uh, and especially those sitting in your seats uh, what, what the war will be in the next five, ten years to come. Now th this year actually we, we pick up on, on what Katia just, just told you and uh, with John uh, we will open a postgraduate actually uh, class in the, in the spring uh, on, uh, on international trade and we believe that uh, you know we, you, you should really keep your attention and focus on international trade not only because uh, it's, uh, it's really becoming a dominant issue uh, in the world, uh, and uh, but as Katia told me yesterday, uh, wherever goods go through, there is no war. You know, wh whenever uh, there is dialogue, uh, whenever there is a freedom uh, of trade, uh, and uh, and there are uh, discussions, sometimes even harsh, uh, but whenever the talk is open, uh, there is no war, uh, and that's really what we want to avoid uh, in the future to come. Uh, so thanks again, Katya, thanks to uh, the Dean Kevin, and thanks very much especially to John for making this possible.